Australien brennt, die Gletscher schmelzen, die Wälder verdorren, die Böden sind hart und trocken. Wir kennen die Bilder, dennoch unternehmen wir wenig. Jonathan Safran Foer, mit dem ich gleich spreche, glaubt, wir müssen die Geschichte einfach anders und besser erzählen. Und wer sollte das können, wenn nicht er? Er ist einer der wichtigsten Schriftsteller der USA und hat 2010 auch bei uns die besten Listen gestürmt mit seinem Sachbuch «Tiere essen», einer radikalen Kritik an der Massentierhaltung. In seinem neuesten Buch «Wir sind das Klima» knüpft er sich nichts Geringeres vor als die Rettung der Welt. Herzlich willkommen, Jonathan Safran Foer. Hi, thank you. Ja, die Welt retten, ein großes Ziel. Ging es nicht ein bisschen kleiner? <lacht> um, the goal that I talk about is a bit smaller. The, the title <lacht> is very big, but actually the content of the book is modest. Um, I wrote it because I was feeling something that I know a lot of people have been feeling, which is an awareness of what's going on, um, absolute certainty that you know, the world is warming, as scientists tell us, and a knowledge of the activities that are making the world warm. And yet, um, despite knowing that, and despite caring about it, and despite talking about it all the time, you know, at dinner parties, or with my friends, or with my children, or even to myself, um, despite all of that, I was living a life that didn't seem to reflect my values, and a life not of saving the planet or destroying the planet in any kind of heroic way, um, but in these tiny domestic ways, these little choices that we're constantly making, like whether to drive or whether mm -hmm. to ride a bicycle or whether to fly or whether to take a train or what to eat. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to think about it, not as a scientist, not as a journalist even, but as just an individual who is living a busy life and wanting to do the right mm. thing. Und wir machen einen kleinen Spoiler, was sozusagen dabei herauskommt. Man muss ja im Buch ein bisschen warten. Man muss lesen bis Seite 78, bis Sie sagen, worum es Ihnen eigentlich geht oder was Sie empfehlen, um die Welt zu retten, sage ich jetzt trotzdem mal. Sie sagen, wir sollten verzichten auf den Konsum von tierischen Produkten, also eigentlich vegan leben, bis zum Abendessen. Also bis zum Abendessen darauf achten. Nachher können wir eigentlich tun, was wir wollen. Ist das nicht, ähm, wie soll ich sagen, sogar ziemlich vorsichtig? Ich meine, abends kann ich dann essen, was ich will. Ist vielleicht gar nicht so schwierig. Well, first of all, it's not, it's very important to make clear that it's not my opinion. And it's not an argument that I'm making. And it's not a perspective. It's just the science. And it's not controversial at all. If you even spend a few minutes, you know, on your laptop or even on your phone, and look at the United Nations reports on climate change or the IPCC or pretty much any scientific study that's out there, there's a very broad consensus that there are four things that we do as individuals that matter much, much more than everything else, which are to fly less, to live without a car, to eat fewer animal products and to have fewer children. So one of the challenges is those things are things that we like. Mm -hmm. You know, if all it was required to solve climate change was to stop, you know, stabbing ourselves with knives, then we would have done it a long time ago. But it's very pleasurable to fly and to see the world. And it's pleasurable for a lot of people to be a parent. And it's certainly pleasurable to eat foods that are delicious. Um, we know that animal products are the most destructive kind of food that we can eat. They produce more greenhouse gas emissions than everything else in the world everything else in the world put together. And we also know how much we need to reduce. And it's not total. We don't all need to become vegans. Mm -hmm. The most comprehensive um, analysis of the relationship between food and the environment was published at the end of 2018. And it said that while people who live in malnourished parts of the world, in parts of Africa, parts of Asia, can eat a little bit more meat and a little more dairy, citizens of Europe, uh, the UK and the United States, need to reduce our meat consumption by about 90% and our dairy by about 60% in order to avoid what the authors called catastrophic, irreversible climate catastrophe. Mm. 
Da gibt es ja auch unterschiedliche Zahlen, wie groß der Beitrag der Nutztierhaltung insgesamt eigentlich ist auf diese Frage der ähm, Treibhausgasemissionen, also der Frage auch, wie sehr, wie schnell der Klimawandel vorangehen wird. Sie nennen, also diskutieren das ja sehr ausführlich. Dieses Buch ist, obwohl es von einem Schriftsteller geschrieben ist, ein sehr sachlich kundiges Buch mit ganz vielen wissenschaftlichen Daten auch. Und die beiden Zahlen, die herumgeistern, sind 14,5 Prozent. Das ist die Zahl, die die FAO, also der, ähm, die Welt, Welternährungsorganisation, ähm, dafür plädiert. Ist die eine Zahl. Die andere Zahl ist 51 Prozent, ähm, die Zahl des World Watch Institutes. Und Sie sagen ganz klar, wir sollten die höhere Zahl nehmen, weil nämlich die tiefere Zahl ganz viele Dinge nicht mit einberechnet, die das Fleisch essen oder das Milch trinken eben auch mit sich bringen. Right, so one of the reasons that the figures are so different are because of the factors that they either take into account or don't take into account. So for example, um, 91% of the Amazonian deforestra deforestation is because of livestock, cattle, either to create land for the cattle to graze or to create land to grow crops for the cattle. So we know that when we burn the Amazon, a lot of carbon is released from the trees. But do we also include the fact that the trees would have, if they had been allowed to just exist as forest, they would have absorbed a lot of the carbon. Mm -hmm. So the 14.5 number doesn't take that into account. Mm -hmm. The 51% does. But in a way, debating the difference, even though the difference is very vast, mm -hmm. it misses the point mm -hmm. because Whether it's 14 and a half or 51, what every scientist agrees on is what the IPCC said in their most recent report, which is we cannot meet the goals of the Paris Climate Accords. Even if we turned off all of our lights, even if we stopped flying mm -hmm. and stopped driving tomorrow, we cannot meet the goals mm -hmm. unless we reduce the amount of animal products that we eat. Und das ist der Grund, warum Sie auch wieder sich mit diesem Thema jetzt auseinandersetzen. Sie haben vorhin vier äh, Punkte genannt, bei denen wir individuell ansetzen können. Darunter war eben auch die Frage, weniger Kinder zu bekommen. Sie selber sind ja auch Vater von zwei Kindern, Sie haben zwei Söhne. Nun gab es da ja auch ähm, einigen Aufruhr, nämlich um eine Zahl ähm, des Club of Rome, die gesagt haben, es sind tatsächlich 58,6 Tonnen CO2, die wir einsparen würden pro Kind, das wir nicht bekommen. Währenddessen, Sie sagen, mit der Ernährung, die Sie äh, vorschlagen, sparen wir 1,3 Tonnen CO2. Dann denkt man, eigentlich wäre das Beste doch wirklich, keine Kinder mehr zu bekommen. Well, we have to solve all of these problems or we have no hope. So it's not a case of it's better not to have kids or it's better to eat less meat or it's better to fly less or it's better to have solar panels or it's better to get an electric car. Mm -hmm. Climate change is a global problem and it's a very nuanced and complicated problem and the solution is going to have to be global and nuanced. Um, everybody's looking for a silver bullet. Like if we just do this, can we save the planet? The reality is we're not going to save the planet and we're not going to lose the planet. There, we're at the beginning of a process of loss. There are a lot of things that we're going to lose, like um, some number of coastal cities we are going to lose, like Venice and Miami we are going to lose. We're going to lose some portion of the Amazon. We're going to um, lose some number of lives to wildfires and droughts and illnesses. We're going to lose some number of years of average life expectancy. The question is, how much can we tolerate? How much loss can we tolerate? And that will be determined by how much change we mm -hmm. can tolerate. So if we can control overpopulation, we will reduce some of the loss. If we can control our diets, we will reduce some of the loss. But I think that um, it's very tempting to oversimplify it mm -hmm. by saying, if we just do mm -hmm. this, When in fact it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. Und es ist nicht nur die Frage, dass wir es nicht vereinfachen sollen, sondern auch die Frage, dass wir schnell in so ein Schwarz-Peter-Spiel hineinkommen, dass wir sagen, eigentlich geht es doch darum, kein Fleisch mehr zu essen. Naja, nein, eigentlich geht es ums Fliegen, eigentlich geht es ums Kinder haben, eigentlich geht es um die Währung Bitcoin, die so viel Strom braucht. Eigentlich geht es um die zu vielen Kleider, die wir kaufen. Und wir beginnen dauernd sozusagen das Problem zu verschieben und uns auch ein bisschen zu beruhigen, weil wir denken, so wirklich viel kann ich gar nicht tun, weil es gibt ja noch viel größere Probleme. I completely agree. And you know, this book, it's not really a work of science, it's not really a work of journalism. Um, it is a work of nonfiction, but I think its basis is psychology and how it is that we can sort out all of mm -hmm. these feelings that we have 
um, and how those feelings interact with the choices that we make. There's a poll in America recently that found that more than half of all teenagers feel fear. Right now they feel afraid and they feel angry. And I think that most adults feel that same mixture along with all kinds of other feelings, a kind of pessimism at times, a kind of optimism at times, um, anger, frustration, sadness, uh, resolve to mm. be a part of the solution. And um, that, that kind of mixture of emotions can lead us in two very different directions. One is oversimplification and a kind of defensiveness, you know, that leads us to just excuse ourselves from the problem mm. and um, maybe accuse others of not participating at the same time. Or to really dig in and to say, look, I'm a human being and I like to eat meat and I like to travel. I like my children, you know, I want to have children. I'm clearly not gonna become some kind of ethical robot, but even within the reality of what it means to be a human, I want to do as much as I can. And maybe my amount is less than somebody else's and maybe it's more than another person's, but I don't have to worry about this and this. Mm -hmm. The beginning, at least the beginning, is to look at ourselves and say what's possible for me? What are my best ways of responding to the science? Über diese Gefühle, die wir haben können angesichts der, sagen wir jetzt mal, drohenden Katastrophe, möchte ich später noch mit Ihnen sprechen, weil ich glaube, das ist ein ganz zentrales Thema. Was mich manchmal beelendet, ich habe gemerkt, ich habe das Buch mit großer Faszination gelesen, habe gedacht, okay, so einfach wäre es eigentlich und dann müsste ich ja auch gar nicht so viel tun und genau das ist das Entlastende. Aber dann habe ich auch ein Interview gelesen im Tagesanzeiger kürzlich mit dem Lebensmittelhändler Christian Jörg, ein Schweizer, der in Saudi-Arabien bei der staatlichen Ernährungsmittelvorsorge arbeitet. Und der sagt, wir stehen vor einem gigantischen Fleischboom, weil Fleischkonsum korreliert mit Reichtum, mit Vermögen. Und viele große Nationen, China beispielsweise oder überhaupt der Kontinent Afrika, die Menschen werden reicher und reicher und werden mehr und mehr Fleisch konsumieren. Und das hat etwas Deprimierendes. It is depressing. <laughs> You're right, and it's true. Um, but there's two forces moving in opposite directions at the same time. One is affluence and the other is conscientiousness. So affluence, the reason people eat meat, or a large part of the reason they eat meat, is because it signifies success. Mm -hmm. It signifies power. Um, it may be that those signifiers are changing. They're certainly changing among young people. You know, on American college campuses right now, across the entire country of America, there are more vegetarians than there are Catholics. So for young people, for teenagers, meat does not signify affluence and success. It signifies wastefulness, consumerism, and environmental destruction. So my hope is that the culture will continue to change as quickly as it is changing mm -hmm. right now. And people who have a lot of money won't say, I want to eat a steak at night. They'll mm -hmm. find other ways to feel good about themselves or to you know, express their wealth. The second thing I would say is some of the countries that you mentioned are actually at the forefront of meat reduction. So China, which is of course the largest country in the world, has a national initiative right now to reduce meat consumption across the country by half in the next decade. Mm -hmm. So by 2030, China wants to eat half as much meat as mm -hmm. they do now for environmental reasons. Mm -hmm. And they've brought over all kinds of American movie stars, international movie stars and directors who are making commercials saying to the average Chinese citizen, we need to eat less meat to save mm -hmm. the planet. Mm -hmm. So there are reasons to be optimistic and there are reasons to be very, very worried. Mm -hmm. Eine Frage ist ja auch, wie sehr braucht es das Individuum, wie sehr braucht es meinen Beitrag und wie sehr brauchen wir die Politik oder eine systemische Lösung sozusagen. Und das war ein Vorwurf, der Ihnen manchmal gemacht worden ist, dass man gesagt hat, wir brauchen doch eigentlich politische Lösungen. Warum appellieren Sie nicht, äh, keine Ahnung, an die Legislative, an die UNO, an die Behörden, an die Steuerbehörden? Äh, Warum schreiben Sie ein Buch für das Individuum? Well, we need both. Mm -hmm. You know, individuals cannot solve the climate crisis, but we cannot solve the climate crisis without individuals. So the kinds of decisions that I write about, you know, flying, eating, um, driving, and having fewer children, have profound impacts, real measurable impacts on the climate. 
it's also true that they have real and measurable impacts on the culture and on corporations and on politicians. So one example is in America, when I wrote this book uh, about a year ago, there was not a fast food restaurant in the country that I know of that carried a veggie burger. You just couldn't find it anywhere. So if you're going for a drive, as I often did from New York to DC where my, my parents live, and I stopped at a Burger King, there's just nothing mm. to eat. Now, every single fast food restaurant in the country carries a veggie burger, a Beyond Burger or an Impossible Burger. Um, Beyond Meat is had the largest initial public offering of any, com any company in the last 20 years in America. And the reason that they're serving these foods is not because the government said you have to do it, and it's not because the CEOs are good people. Mm. It's because consumers said, I want this. As we say we want it, it changes the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And as the marketplace changes, it becomes easier to make good choices. And so we make more good choices. And as we make more good choices, corporations change even more. Mm -hmm. And laws will start to follow habits. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with electric cars. Tesla just became the biggest car company in American history. And it's not because the government said we need to make electric mm -hmm. cars. It's because there was a demand for it. Das heißt, wenn ich Sie richtig verstehe, dann sagen Sie sozusagen, der einzelne Konsument hat ja auch eine Macht und die Politik, die könnte nachziehen. Ernst Fehr, ein äh, berühmter Schweizer Ökonome, hat kürzlich gesagt, er wäre auch für eine Steuer auf alle Produkte, und zwar eine Steuer, die proportional zum Ausdruck bringt, wie groß der Beitrag eben ist zum Klimawandel. Und dann könnte man quasi umverteilen, man verteuert die Produkte, die schädlich sind für die Umwelt, künstlich. Und man nimmt Geld ein, man könnte das Geld sogar umverteilen an die Bevölkerung, hätte also zugleich auch noch einen, eine Art ähm, Umverteilung innerhalb der Bevölkerung. Das wäre eine Idee, die Sie wahrscheinlich sogar unterschreiben würden. Sie würden einfach sagen, das ist nicht das, worum es mir geht im Buch. Well, I would absolutely support that, but I would describe it differently. Mm -hmm. What you said is to make um, things that are bad for the environment artificially more expensive. I would say, let's stop making them artificially cheap. You know, if a hamburger has an environmental toll that somebody has to pay for. You know, even if we don't pay for it at the cash register, somebody pays for it. Somebody pays for, the United Nations said that animal agriculture is one of the top two or three causes of every significant environmental problem on the planet. Air pollution, water pollution, loss of biodiversity, deforestation. Who pays for it when it happens? We do, or our children will, or our grandchildren will. So what I would say is, let's just make a hamburger cost what it actually costs. Let's make cars cost, let's make air travel costs what it actually costs. And if a plane ticket from Europe to America suddenly becomes $15,000 because that's what it actually costs us and we fly less, then that's a free market. You know, that's not, people describe it as an imposition or as a, some kind of um, artificial price fixing in order to take something away from us. I would say the prices have been artificially deflated, encouraging us to make bad choices that our children and our grandchildren will have to pay for. Es ist auch ganz oft in Ihrem Buch so, oder auch wenn man sie sonst liest, das Gefühl, dass Sie dafür plädieren, Perspektiven zu ändern, neu zu sehen. Es gibt ein Bild äh, in Ihrem Buch, das immer wieder auftaucht, nämlich das Bild der Erde von außen gesehen, wo Sie quasi sagen, der erste Mann auf dem Mond hat diesen Moonshot gemacht, dieser Moment, in dem man die Welt von außen gesehen hat. Und dieser Perspektivenwechsel, der ist immer wieder der Moment, in dem wir Dinge ganz neu sehen und vielleicht auch fast schon auf neue Gedanken kommen. So about 500 or so human beings have seen the entire Earth from space. And um, the experience that they have is very consistent. It's so consistent that they've given it a name, the overview effect, which is a feeling of um, just being moved, you know, emotionally. And seeing the Earth, as strange as it sounds, having the sudden realization that we live on a planet, it's so easy to forget, even though it's the most obvious thing you can imagine, but we live on a planet. And when astronauts see that planet from space, from a distance, they tend to see that it's fragile, see that it is surrounded by a seemingly infinite bl blackness, that it's our only home, and that we need to protect it. And that kind of perspective has changed them. You know, a lot of astronauts come back and go into philanthropy or spirituality. And I think that I will never see the Earth from space. You will never see the Earth from space, yeah, right. <laughs> probably. But we have our own versions mm -hmm. of the overview effect. I get it at New Year's Eve sometimes. Mm -hmm. I get it on my birthdays sometimes. 
Um, on my children's birthdays, uh, when a loved one passes away, I get it. These moments of looking back and seeing life and remembering how precious it is, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, it's, that we need to be careful. Sie haben dieses Buch ja zum Teil auch geschrieben am Sterbebett Ihrer eigenen Großmutter. Ihre Großmutter, die 1941 aus einem Städtel geflohen ist, als 20-Jährige. Ihre Familie wurde danach umgebracht. Und diese Momente, in denen Sie mit der Schreibmaschine oder Ihren Notizbüchern an diesem Bett sitzen, die scheinen Sie sehr geprägt zu haben. War das für Sie auch so ein Overview-Effekt? Absolut. Ja, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, seeing this person who, I don't blame myself for this. I, I, don't, I don't feel ashamed to admit that I ignored her most of the time. You know, we, that, that's what life is. You just ignore the people who you love most of the time, people who take care of you, especially if they are like a parent or grandparent, you know, a little bit older. Um, she was almost like furniture in the house so much of the time because I was young and I wanted to do other things and play ball outside or hang out with my friends. Why would I want to sit down with somebody who was 80 years old, 90 years old, almost 100 years old at the end um, and, have, and have that kind of conversation? But then when I was with her at the end, um, I, I saw her very, very differently and saw the sacrifices that she made and the bravery that she had that um, is the reason that my family exists at all. Her siblings were killed, her parents were killed, her grandparents were killed, all of her friends were killed. She was the only member of her family to survive the war. Um, I always knew that, but I'm not sure I always felt that. Mm -hmm. And a large part of this book is about the difference between the things that we know mm -hmm. in our heads and the things that we know in our hearts and how difficult it can be to move yeah. Things from up there down to here. Und diese Bewegung von oben nach unten, vom Denken vielleicht auch ins Fühlen, das ist sozusagen das Grundmotiv, das, das Grundanliegen auch des Buches. Jetzt haben Sie sehr schön beschrieben, wie wir alle diese Overview-Momente haben, in denen uns das passiert. Man kann es auch herstellen durch gute Geschichten, durch das Erzählen von guten Geschichten. Und ich habe es schon gesagt, wer könnte das, wenn nicht Sie, weil Sie ein Schriftsteller sind, Fühlen Sie auch eine spezielle Verantwortung als Schriftsteller, eben solche Bücher auch zu schreiben, nicht nur Romane, sondern sich hinzusetzen und zu sagen, ich versuche, eine Geschichte zu erzählen, die die Leute aufrüttelt und sie zum Handeln bringt? Uh, you know, I probably feel a responsibility that's similar to the responsibility that you feel. You know, you, you're having me on today to talk about this subject when you could have had people with subjects that are much sexier or funnier or more um, attractive to like a casual viewer. But there's something that you, in here where you said this is important and we need to talk about it. Das ist so, wobei Sie natürlich auch sehr attraktiv sind als Gast. Die Leute wollen hören, was Sie zu sagen haben. <laughs> so I, at a reading that I did very recently in London, it, at the end of a reading, there's always like a question and answer mm -hmm. session. And the final question was from an eight-year-old girl um, she was sitting in the front row, and she asked me, do you think that we will solve this problem, that we'll save the planet? And I told her the truth, which is, I don't know. And I said, do you think we will? And she said, I don't know if we'll do it in time. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do you think would be required to do it in time? And she said, I think we would have to always be talking about it. So. Writing books is one of my ways of talking about things, not only with a, the public, but with myself, you know, of, of figuring something out. It's my best way of being sensitive and careful with material that I care about. Um, and that's true whether it's a novel or nonfiction. Um, and of course, this is another way of talking about it. And I very much believe what she said. The climate crisis involves technology and it involves money, um, and it involves politics, and it involves values, but all of that is about conversation. And whether it's you know, a political conversation that voters are having with their elected officials, or whether it's about a dinner table conversation that we have with our kids, we need to keep it at the forefront of our minds. It needs to occupy as large a part of our lives as it, as it deserves, as the scale of the crisis mm -hmm. deserves. Mm -hmm. 
Es braucht die Technologie, es braucht die Ökonomie, es braucht die Politik, es braucht uns alle und es braucht die Geschichten. Und bei den Geschichten fällt ja auch auf, dass die Geschichten auch Figuren brauchen. Sie machen sehr deutlich in dem Buch auch, dass es im Grunde genommen manchmal sehr darauf ankommt, welche Figur sich für die Geschichte eignet. Und Sie führen eine Person ein, die ich nicht gekannt habe, nämlich eine Claudette Colvin oder Colvin, ich weiß gar nicht, wie man den Namen ausspricht. Ich kannte sie nicht, aber ich kenne Rosa Parks. Jeder kennt Rosa Parks, die in Montgomery, Alabama ähm, 1955 aufgestanden ist äh, oder sich eben nicht äh, erhoben hat im Bus und nicht Platz gemacht hat ähm, für einen weißen Mann und damit eigentlich die Bürgerrechtsbewegung losgetreten hat. Sie sagen, Moment, es gibt eine andere Geschichte. Erzählen Sie vielleicht mal kurz die andere Geschichte, die eben nicht zur Story wurde. Well, as you said, there's a young woman named Claudette Colvin, and it was about nine months before Rosa Parks did what she did. Claudette Colvin did something very, very similar, um, refused to move to the back of the bus. And um, the NAACP decided that she might not be the best spokesperson, the best storyteller, the best hero of the story um, at that moment in time because she was 15 years old. She was pregnant with the child of a married man. And she came from a bad family, what they would call a bad family. Um, and Rosa Parks, on the other hand, was um, an active member of the ACLU. She um, was a strategist, um, extremely savvy. And part of what she recognized is that history is both true and fabricated and created. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a coincidence that so many good stories make history um, and that so many iconic images and figures and um, become historical. Uh, in the book I say, you know, with Christianity, it's, it's sort of a joke but it's sort of true. Would, as a thought experiment, would Christianity have spread if instead of being crucified on a cross, Jesus had been drowned in a bathtub? You know, would people wear bathtubs around their neck? Uh, Would September 11th have, have been September 11th if those buildings weren't the most easy to draw buildings in the world? Would Hitler have been Hitler without the mustache? Would Gandhi have been Gandhi without the loincloth? Barack Obama changed his name to Barack from Barry. You know, do you think that Barry Obama would have been president? Mm -hmm. Barack is such a more iconic, heroic name. I don't know, but we ha we. It becomes ob it's obvious, it's been obvious with climate change, the need to have iconic figures. With Und eine solche Figur ist ja vielleicht Greta Thunberg. So wird es auf jeden Fall sehr oft gesagt. Es das heißt sehr oft, Greta Thunberg hat das Potenzial, eine Bewegung loszutreten, weil sie ein Mädchen ist. Ich meine, mittlerweile ist sie eigentlich eine erwachsene Frau. Es wird auch immer wieder gesagt, naja, sie hat Asperger. Das heißt, sie ist eigentlich selber von einer verletzlichen Gruppe von Menschen. Das macht sie vielleicht auch besonders glaubwürdig. Auf der anderen Seite hat sie gerade kürzlich wieder am World Economic Forum in Davos gesagt, alle hören mir zu, keiner tut was. Das stimmt so natürlich nicht, es gehen viele auf die Straße, aber sie ist trotzdem frustriert, dass sie denkt, ich habe doch eine Geschichte, ich erzähle euch doch was und trotzdem passiert zu wenig. Well, I think she's underestimating her own influence. Um She's right and, and she's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but I think she's right to say it, <laughs> to say what she's <laughs> saying. She's wrong in the sense that she's mobilized millions of people and, and tens of millions and probably hundreds of millions. There would not be people marching in the streets on Fridays if mm -hmm. it were not for her. Uh, at Davos right now, they would not be talking about it to the extent that they are, even if it's crap, but they wouldn't be talking about it at all were it not for her. I'm not sure we would be sitting here right now if it were not for her. So her influence has been really profound, but she's also right that there's a risk of it becoming about emotions rather than actions. You know, people who, who watch videos of Greta Thunberg and cry and feel hope and inspired as if that were what it meant to be an environmentalist, to watch videos of Greta Thunberg instead of changing their lives in the way that she has. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the same time that we've had Greta as a kind of hero, Our first hero, you might say, of, of the climate crisis. We have our first real villain in Donald Trump. And I worked for Hillary and I wanted Hillary to win. But there is this one perverted sense in which I'm grateful that Donald Trump is president because he has 
um, given us a kind of reflection of ourselves. He's the embodiment of what we don't want, what we're afraid of. Mm -hmm. And I think he has been probably as effective as Greta has been at mobilizing people, especially young people, to say, enough is enough, we need to change the world. Mm -hmm. Sie beschreiben dieses sich anstecken lassen von einer Geschichte mit dem Bild einer Welle. Wir kennen diese Wellen in Sportstadien. Hier gibt es ein Bild einer Welle. Menschen machen eine Welle und es reißt einen mit. Und Sie sagen dazu im Buch etwas, was mich, was mich wirklich berührt hat, einen großartigen Satz. Sie sagen nämlich, noch nie hat mich eine Welle zufällig in dem Moment erreicht, als die Begeisterung mich packte. Wellen brauchen kein Gefühl, sie bringen es hervor. Und das gefällt mir sehr, weil ich denke, genau so ist es. Man sitzt da und man ist vielleicht gar nicht so begeistert, aber die Welle reißt einen mit. Und dann haben wir ja eigentlich so eine Huhn-Ei-Frage. Wer tritt denn die Welle los? Wir müssen jemanden finden oder Stoffe finden, die die Welle lostreten. Sind diese Wellen solche Overview-Momente oder Figuren, beides zusammen? Oder haben Sie noch andere Ideen? I don't think there's any one thing that triggers a wave. First of all, I would say it's happening now. It's already happening. Um, it, once you're inside of it, it can be hard to recognize that it's happening because it's like the old joke about two fish meet one day and one says, oh, the water's very warm, and the other says, what the hell is water? <laughs> you know, when, when we are inside of a context, it's very hard to notice. But the world has changed so much in the last year in terms of our awareness of climate change, our willingness, our eagerness to talk about it, and our willingness and eagerness to change our lives in response to it. If someone had asked me a year ago, or said to me a year ago, do you think the Golden Globes will be vegan? I would have said, no, of course not. I mean, why would they be? Do you think that the winner of the best actor is going to get on stage and talk about the need to eat less meat for the sake of the environment, as Joaquin Phoenix did? I would have said, no, of course not. If you had said, do you think that Beyond Meat is going to be the most successful company in America. Mm -hmm. I would have said, of course not. Mm -hmm. um, if someone had said that, you know, the, an electric car company is going to be the most successful, the largest ca car company in the history of the United States, I never could have imagined it. And now we take these things for granted. And the rate of change is accelerating. And I don't think it's because of any one thing or any one person. Mm -hmm. Es stimmt schon, es verändert sich viel, wobei ich manchmal den Eindruck habe, ich lebe auch in einer, in einer Bubble. In meinem Umfeld ist es für die meisten Menschen ein Thema, sich zu überlegen, was sie essen oder zu versuchen, weniger zu fliegen. Wenn man in einer Stadt wie Zürich lebt, braucht man schlicht kein Auto. Ich habe noch nie ein Auto besessen und das geht ganz vielen in meiner Umgebung so. Und trotzdem hat man den Eindruck, man tut irgendwie zu wenig und zugleich merkt man immer wieder, es ist genau, wie Sie es beschreiben, Verstehen ist das eine, sich motiviert fühlen und wirklich ins Handeln kommen ist das andere. Und das ist ja ein philosophisches Problem, was zum Beispiel schon David Hume beschrieben hat, der gesagt hat, es widerspricht eigentlich dem Verstand nicht, lieber keinen kleinen Schnitt im Finger zu haben, als zu verhindern, dass irgendwo ein Haus zusammenkracht. Und das ist eigentlich wahnsinnig frustrierend, zu merken, das, was wir denken, ist eigentlich doch was ganz anderes, wie das, was wir tun. Da gibt es einen großen Unterschied. Mhm. Und das Zwischending ist das Mitgefühl, das wirklich das, das Fühlen. Also ist die Frage letztendlich, wie kreieren wir diese Gefühle? It's funny you should mention that, because it happens that I scratched my finger. I don't know if you can see. <lacht> ich sehe es. Yeah, yeah, very badly. Yesterday, um, I couldn't get it to stop bleeding. And, and it's true. It was all I could think about. And I was obsessed with it. And, you know, trying to make it stop. I was talking to my friends. Oh my God, my finger hurts so much. You know, it's... Um, it's very hard to keep things in their proper scale mm -hmm. and in their proper perspective. But maybe we can just acknowledge that that's what it is to be a human being and find ways to overcome it rather than to pretend it's not the truth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you go to a store and there's something that you like and that you would like to have, do you think about stealing it or do you, do you always pay for it? Ehrlich gesagt, mache ich schon eher das Zweite. You always pay for it. Of course mm -hmm. you do. Me too. Mm -hmm. And why, how do you make the decision not to steal? Do you need to have a memory of the social Nein. contract? Do you need to have some kind of well of emotions about the shopkeeper? Why, why don't you steal? What is it about you that makes you not steal? 
Wahrscheinlich wollen Sie darauf hinaus, dass es ein Automatismus ist, oder? Ich überlege mir das ja gar nicht. You don't think about it because you're somebody who just doesn't steal. Yeah. You just don't mm -hmm. do it. Um, maybe it's because a little bit because of the law, but I don't think that's the majority of the explanation. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because of how you were raised. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because of how you want to see yourself. Or, but it's not actually a decision. You just don't do it. And so what we need is to become people who just don't steal from the planet. And we just don't steal from the future. Das finde ich wahnsinnig interessant. Das erinnert mich an einen Aufsatz von Cora Diamond, eine Philosophin, die sich auf Wittgenstein bezieht. Und die sagt, wir sind Tiere, die keine Tiere der gleichen Spezies essen. Wir essen nämlich keine Menschen. Vielleicht könnte man dieses Fleisch ja so zubereiten, dass es uns schmecken würde, dass es auch nicht krank macht. Aber wir tun das nicht. Das gehört nicht zu der Art und Weise, wie wir leben. Und wenn ich Sie richtig verstehe, würden Sie sagen, wir müssen lernen, uns so zu verändern, dass wir gewisse Dinge einfach nicht mehr tun. Yeah, and it's and it's we have a long history of that. We also don't eat dogs by the way and we also don't eat koalas. You know everybody now you see these images in Australia mm. of um of dead koalas on the side of the road mm. and people become so upset as if how could human humankind have allowed that to happen mm. when we forget that we kill 50 billion animals every year and that those 50 billion are a large part of why that koala is dead on the side of the road. But um, we're not people who keep slaves, but we used to be. We're not people, um, or we're trying not to be a people who um, treat women differently than men. You know, that's one journey that we're on right now. Um, but we have for all of humankind. There are a lot of things that we used to do, and then a kind of moral revolution happens, and however long it takes and however arduous it is and however difficult it is to imagine before it happens, right after it happens, we look back and say, how could we have ever been like that? How could we have ever done that? Es gibt ja manchmal auch Personen, die sagen, es braucht vielleicht gar nicht so sehr eine Veränderung von uns. Wir haben ja auch die Technik. Wir können eine technologische Lösung machen. Es gibt die unterschiedlichsten Vorstellungen, wie der Klimawandel gebremst werden kann. Einer, der zu meinem großen Erstaunen bei uns in der Sendung für technologische Lösungen plädiert hat, ist Al Gore. Und er war bei Yves Bossa zu Gast. Wir hören ihm ganz kurz zu. And this kind of exponential change we are familiar with in the technology area, with Moore's Law and mobile phones and many other devices. It's very exciting that that same pattern is now appearing with renewable energy, with LED lighting, electric vehicles, batteries, thousands of new technologies. The world is now in the early stages of a global sustainability revolution empowered by the digital tools we have, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things. It has the scale of the industrial revolution, but the speed of the digital revolution. Mm. It is a reality in our lives, and we should see it as a, a, a basis for genuine hope. We can solve this. We will solve this. Sind Sie so hoffnungsfroh? You know, Al Gore is a vegan for environmental reasons. So it's not only the case that he's hopeful about the possibility of technological solutions. He's also taking steps as an individual to do what's necessary in the meantime. And so I might say that that's a good balance to have. There is one thing he didn't mention, though, which is the industrial revolution and the digital revolution were driven by money and only by money. That was the only incentive for companies to innovate. And now it cannot be the only incentive. You know, green technologies will be lucrative and people are going to make a ton of money um, working on the climate crisis. But it's not, it doesn't necessarily make sense in a holistic way as business. And um, the people who talk about the um, possibilities of technology solving these problems, you never ever hear them say, which is why we should invest $2 trillion dollars in governmental research, which is why the tax rates should go up 10% until we've solved the climate crisis. Nobody's willing to invest in that idea. They just present that idea as a way of excusing oneself from having to do other kinds of hard work. Mm -hmm. 
Also Sie sind da ein bisschen skeptisch. Aber vielleicht können wir auch noch wirklich über den Begriff der Hoffnung sprechen und zu diesem Gefühl zurückkehren, das uns befallen kann, wenn wir über die Klimakrise nachdenken. Sie sagen im Buch, es gibt eigentlich nichts, was Sie zugleich so hoffnungsfroh und so hoffnungslos macht wie der Klimawandel. Und Sie haben diese Geschichte erzählt von diesem Mädchen, das Sie gefragt hat, ob Sie glauben, dass wir es noch lösen können und das dann selber gesagt hat, vielleicht nicht rechtzeitig. Haben Sie Tage, an denen sind Sie verzweifelt und Tage, da sind Sie voller Hoffnung? Oder ist das immer gleichzeitig in Ihnen drin, dieses Gefühl? I go back and forth. You know, sometimes something, I will read an article about mm -hmm. how we have underestimated the amount of methane that's being released into the atmosphere. And it's, you know, it kind of takes the air out of me and I feel um, a kind of despair. Or when I listen to Trump, talk, I feel a kind of despair. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are other things that make me feel very hopeful. Um, it's almost a joke in my family that I will often gather my kids together and I'll say, guys, I think we're going to solve this problem. I do. I remember the last time I said it to them was uh, a chef who's very, very famous in the United States named Samin Nosrat. She has a TV show on Netflix called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. And she's sort of a large personality in the American culture. She read this book and she said that she would not eat animal products for breakfast and lunch. And I thought, wow, if chefs start talking about this and if restaurants start reducing their meat consumption, mm -hmm. not only doing it, but talking about why they're doing it, that feels like something that could reverberate, you know, very quickly and very powerfully. I felt the same thing when I watched the Golden Globes and you see celebrities mm -hmm. talking about it. I think it's a matter of time before people like Michelle Obama, you know, go on TV and say, our family is going to reduce our meat consumption because we believe in science mm. and we know what the science is telling us. So when those kinds of things happen, I feel extremely hopeful. But um, there are other times when I don't want to see my kids. You know, I don't want to have to look them in the eyes because I feel so sure that we're ruining the world for them. <laughs> Etwas, was mich sehr deprimiert hat im letzten Jahr, war ein Beitrag von Jonathan Franzen, einem anderen US-amerikanischen Schriftsteller, dem New Yorker geschrieben hat, wir sollten mal aufhören, so zu tun, als gäbe es die Katastrophe noch irgendwie abzuwenden. Und es gibt einen anderen Beitrag, den Sie oft zitieren, nämlich von Royce Cranston in New York Times, der einen Beitrag geschrieben hat mit dem Titel «Learning how to die in the Anthropocene». Wo er auch sagt, das größte Problem angesichts des Klimawandels sei eigentlich ein philosophisches, nämlich wie wir jetzt lernen zu sterben und wie wir als Sterbliche auf diese Katastrophe blicken. Diese Beiträge sind es, bei denen ich denke, da muss man aufpassen, dass man nicht in eine Lethargie kippt. You know, there's two ways of looking at those kinds of attitudes. And I should say, they're, they're both really wonderful writers and really wonderful thinkers. Um, but one way of looking at it is, that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. It's just not helpful to say, we're doomed. Um, uh, that's not really my critique. My critique is, it's not true. You know? And when Franzen's essay came out, the strongest response to it was from scientists. Yeah, that's right. Who, who mm -hmm. said, it's just not true. And the, not, the information that he was citing was you know, cherry-picked or misrepresented. Um, As I said earlier, the truth is not that we're doomed. And the truth is not that we will save the planet. The truth is we're going to lose a lot of things. And the amount that we lose will be determined and only determined by what we do. Since the Industrial Revolution, 100% of global warming has been the result of human activity. So everything that's going to happen right now will be the result of human activity. Um, Franzen is right that there are certain things that we are on the path to losing that we cannot save. Um, we're going to lose some coastal cities. We might lose the coral reefs. We're going to lose some percentage of the ice shelf. We're going to lose a lot of species. We're going to lose a lot of human lives. But that doesn't mean we're doomed. Mm. You know. Eine Weile lang hatte ich den Eindruck, diese Apokalypsen-Rhetorik dient dazu, eine Welle loszutreten. Leute denken, wir müssen etwas tun und es steht ein Aktivismus 
Im Moment habe ich das Gefühl, es entsteht das Gegenteil. Leute reagieren so, dass sie in eine so Anything-Goes-Haltung kommen, dass sie denken, ach, wir gehen sowieso unter, spielt ja eh keine Rolle mehr. Und manchmal wird dann auch darauf verwiesen, und sie tun das auch, dass man sagt, es gab ja schon fünf Massensterben vor uns. Schon ganz oft ist die Welt sozusagen untergegangen und es war eigentlich immer eine Klimakatastrophe, Außer bei den Dinosauriern, da ist wahrscheinlich ein Meteoriteneinschlag dafür verantwortlich gewesen, dass die Dinosaurier ausgestorben sind. Der Unterschied ist einfach, dass wir jetzt in einer Zeit leben, in der der Klimawandel menschengemacht ist. Was genau bedeutet dieser Unterschied philosophisch oder intellektuell? It means that it's our choice, not something that we are randomly subjected to, not something that um, is unjust, um, not something that is bad luck. It is the logical conclusion of our actions. So until the relatively recent past, let's say 30 years ago, mm -hmm. maybe 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago for just the average person, we really could plead ignorance. We could say we did not know that we were doing what we were doing, we didn't know that we were causing this amount of destruction. The cause and effect chain wasn't visible to us, but there's nobody who could plead that now. You know, in the United States, which is behind Europe in terms of climate awareness, um, about 91% of Americans say that they accept the science of climate change. 91% mm. of Americans. Twice as many Americans believe in the existence of Bigfoot, you know, the magical creature, <laughs> as deny the existence of climate change. 70% of Americans say they wish the United States had remained in the Paris Climate Accords. That includes the majority of Republicans. This is often represented as a liberal or conservative issue or an urban and rural issue or a religious and secular or old and young, and it's really not. These are just basic values that we share. Um, and now we face the moment when it's, we cannot plead ignorance. We know what's happening. And our decision, and, and one might even say our humanity, will become visible. Mm. You know, are we a species that is capable of saying no to things that we want, like air travel and meat and so many other things, in the interest of something else that we want? Sozusagen die Verantwortung, die aus der Freiheit erwächst, das ist unsere Wahl, sagen Sie, wie wir uns entscheiden, wie wir weitermachen. Sie erzählen, auch äh, an einer gewissen Stelle die Geschichte von Jan Karski, der 1942 ähm, als Katholik äh, in Polen im Warschauer Ghetto beobachtet hat, wie das Ghetto geschlossen wurde, wie die Menschen in Vernichtungslager gebracht wurden oder das Ghetto in ein Vernichtungslager umgewandelt wurde. Und er geht in die USA, er flüchtet und erzählt diese Geschichte einem sehr einflussreichen Anwalt und ihm wird nicht geglaubt. Es wurde Ihnen ein bisschen der Vorwurf gemacht, dass Sie diese Situation jetzt angesichts des Klimawandels vergleichen würden mit Holocaust-Lügern. Ich weiß gar nicht, ob Sie diese Parallele so ziehen wollten. Aber vielleicht können Sie etwas dazu sagen, wie sehr gleichen sich diese Situationen denn wirklich? Um, it's not exactly the parallel that I meant to make. What I wanted to, to do was to, as, as you pointed out, I wrote a lot of the book in this period of my grandmother's dying. Mm. And um, my grandmother, as I said, was the only member of her family to survive the war. She survived um, because she chose to flee. She chose to leave. Her sisters chose to stay. Her parents chose to stay. Her grandparents chose to stay. Um, her cousins, friends, everybody else chose to stay. It's not because they were Holocaust deniers. They knew that the Germans were coming. Um, they didn't believe that what would come would be so different than what came before. You know, my grandmother was not smarter than them, mm -hmm. and she was not a better person than them, mm -hmm. and she was not more afraid of dying. She can't even explain what the difference was between her and them. And that was something that I was thinking about a lot because I am a kind of denier. You know, I, I of course, accept the science, and um, I know what it is that is happening. But there's something in me that doesn't believe that it's happening, because if I were to believe it, I would live a very, very different kind of life. It would be the only thing that I would be focused on. I would never question, you know, the individual choices that I make. I don't think I would have necessarily flown here. 
Genau. Aber es macht doch noch mal einen Unterschied und Sie erzählen ja beide Perspektiven, ob jemand bleibt und getötet wird und die Gefahr, die da kommt, vielleicht nicht richtig einschätzt oder auch gar nicht weiß, was tun. Oder ob äh, die andere Person, die Sie erwähnen, ist eben diese Person, die, die nicht glaubt, dieser Felix Frankfurter heißt er, der sozusagen, ihm wird ja die Geschichte erzählt und die Schwierigkeit ist, dass, das, dass wir ja sehr oft in dieser Situation sind. Es ist ja nicht so, dass wir nichts tun könnten, sondern die Geschichte wird uns erzählt und trotzdem reagieren wir nicht. Und da hatte ich schon den Eindruck, ist eine spezielle Form von Unrecht, das Sie anprangern. So, I'll tell the story very, very quickly, so the viewers know. This 28-year-old Jan Karski, Catholic, mm. um, an incredibly heroic person, smuggled himself into the Warsaw Ghetto and even into an extermination camp in order to gather evidence and testimonies to bring to the West to try to persuade America and England to enter the war and what the Germans were doing. When he came to America, he met with the Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, mm -hmm. who is regarded as one of the smartest people America's ever produced, and he was Jewish as well, mm -hmm. which is relevant to the story. Karski gave him all of the evidence, said, this is what's happening, this is what these people are saying, here's images of this, and Frankfurter asked him a series of questions, and then he said, I have to be honest with you, I can't believe what you're telling me. And um, Karski said, why would you, why would I lie? Why on earth would I lie about this? And Frankfurter said, I didn't say that you're lying. I said that I am unable to believe you. And then he has a very beautiful statement. He said, my mind and my heart were made in such a way that I can't believe you. Um, and it may be that our minds and our hearts were made in such a way that we can't really believe what the scientists are telling us. We don't think they're lying. You know, it's not as if we believe in an alternate scientific truth. We just can't incorporate it into our lives in such a way that we respond accordingly. Um, it doesn't make us evil. It doesn't make us ignorant. Um, it may be just part of what it is to be a human being. But it's also not the end of the story because there are ways of overcoming that lack of belief, mm -hmm. like establishing routines and habits so that you don't have to every time you think about what kind of vacation to mm -hmm. take or every time you're at a restaurant and thinking about what to eat you don't have to wait for that emotion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or that mm -hmm. you know intellect mm -hmm. but it's more like when you're at the store deciding not to steal you're just not the kind of person who steals mm -hmm. und um das geht es um die frage wer wir eigentlich sein wollen eine Idee wäre ja vielleicht auch, mit dieser Untergangsrhetorik umzugehen, sich einfach mal zu überlegen, was verlören wir denn eigentlich, wenn es uns Menschen nicht mehr geben würde. Und es gibt diese Passage in Ihrem Buch, das finde ich von den, von den schönsten Passagen überhaupt, wo Sie einfach wahllos aufzählen, was der Mensch so tut und was es nicht mehr geben würde. Sie haben eine wunderbare Liste, ich nenne nur ein paar Sachen. Wörter lernen. Samen aussehen, Selfies posten, Eifersucht runterschlucken, Landkarten mühevoll zusammenfalten, Verlobungsringe aussuchen, Temperatur von Milch am Handgelenk prüfen, grottige Lobreden zerknüllen, eine ganze Liste. Und ich habe die mit großem Vergnügen gelesen und hatte zunehmend den Eindruck, vielleicht ist es das, wir müssen uns wieder erzählen, zu welcher Zärtlichkeit wir fähig sind, zu welcher Originalität wir fähig sind, was wir auch Großes vermögen, dass wir nicht nur Zerstörungswut in uns tragen, sondern ganz wunderbare Dinge tun können. I agree, but we can't really live our lives always thinking about that. You know, you and I could have a conversation right now and really convince each other, you know, and feel very <laughs> emotional and we could leave the conversation and say, I'm going to change my life. Like, I am devoted to solving, to playing a role in solving this problem, and we would mean it, you know? We could even cry, we would really mean it. And then two hours later, like, life is going on and you have to rush to get to a meeting and I have to, you know, get to my hotel and I'm thinking, oh, it's already late, what am I gonna eat? Gosh, there's really nothing to eat here, so, all right, I'll just, I'll just, this one time I'll just eat the thing that I know I shouldn't eat and I need to get back to New York and obviously I'm not gonna take a boat, so I'll, I'll take a plane. And like the little circumstances of life and what it is to move through a day take our attention and our choices end up gravitating toward what will make our daily lives easier or more pleasurable and we forget about this other mm -hmm. stuff. So 
it's entirely possible to be moved. You know, if I look at an image of um, flooding or fires or a storm, you know, or climate refugees, mm -hmm. I get very, very moved. And there's no question in my mind what I have to do. The problem is I'm not always looking at those images. Mm -hmm. Most of the time I'm looking at my phone mm -hmm. or a newspaper or walking down the street and doing the busyness of life. Mm -hmm. And then we forget. Mm -hmm. Ich wollte eine Welle lostreten, ich wollte die Sachen äh, vorlesen, weil ich gedacht okay. habe, vielleicht kann man das Gespräch so beenden, dass man denkt, es gibt doch diese wunderbaren Dinge, über die wir uns unterhalten können. Jetzt haben Sie sozusagen die Welle wieder ein bisschen gestoppt. Well, I'm sorry about that. <lacht> <lacht> Nein, es ist doch die Frage auch der Ehrlichkeit. Womit enden wir eigentlich? Oder ich weiß es nicht. Vielleicht ist das Ehrlichste zu sagen, es gibt eben wirklich beides, Hoffnung und Verzweiflung. What I think is even better than talking about hope and despair is to speak very concretely and matter-of-factly about what our intentions are for ourselves. So, for example, I gave a reading in Brussels uh, maybe three months ago and at the end there was a book signing and a young couple came up They were maybe like 20 years old. And they put the book in front of me and they opened it to the page where I would sign it, right here. And um, it was filled with their own handwriting. And I said, oh, what is this? And they said, we're going to get married in a couple of months. And we decided tonight that we need to have a plan for how we're going to live our lives. Because if we don't have a plan, we'll just do what we've always done. Because that's what people do. And their plan was to uh, have no more than two children to eat as vegetarians unless they're at a friend's house for dinner and they're served meat and there's no other option, to eat as vegan two days a week, um, and only car sharing no more than 1,500 kilometers a year. And then instead of just having me sign it, they had a line that said, witness, they wanted me to sign. <laughs> and I thought it was very charming and very nice. And then I felt so ashamed because I realized, even though I'd written this book, even though I was the person on stage, even though I was the one signing the book, I didn't have a plan. For myself. I expected my government to have a plan. I expect corporations to have a plan. I even expect the school that my kids go to to have a plan, mm -hmm. but I didn't have a plan. So I went back to my hotel and I wrote a plan. Part of my plan was I won't fly for vacations in 2020. Before I wrote it down, if you had asked me, how do you respond to, to this problem of air travel? I would have said, well, I'm trying to fly less. And it would mean nothing mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. nothing. But the second that you have it in language and with numbers and days, and when you have a witness, it really mm -hmm. changes your life. So I'm not so worried about hope and hopelessness, but how can we make concrete you know, these emotions so that we don't have to rely on our emotions? Ich nehme also mit, wir sollten einen Plan machen, Entschlüsse fassen, das Ganze aufschreiben und unter Beihilfe eines Zeugens unterschreiben. Vielen, well, you know, vielen Dank. You, you could make yours right now to a camera and tell <laughs> everybody who's watching this exactly what you'll do, but I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> Vielleicht braucht es zu Druck. Ich danke Ihnen sehr für dieses Gespräch. Yeah. Vielen, vielen Thank Dank. You.